a car drove up to a house in Westchester, the exclusive county north of New York, where the rich and famous of Manhattan seek a rural retreat. Five shots rang out at the home of Dr. Herman Tarnauer of Scarsdale diet fame. Inside, he lay dying, as the police were called. Outside, they arrested a suspect named Jean Struven Harris. Dr. Tarnauer was rushed to a hospital, and at 11.58, he was declared dead. The international success of his best-selling book would ensure widespread publicity, which grew as it emerged that the arrested woman was his longtime mistress, famous in her own world as the head of a prestigious private girls' school. She was 56 and divorced. He was 68 and unmarried. The son of a New York hat manufacturer, he had graduated in 1933. He began his career in the center of New York, specializing in heart disease, after serving his residency at Bellevue Hospital. In 1938, he had moved out of New York to Westchester General Hospital, where he set up the cardiology department, ahead of his time in prescribing diets for his patients. In 1941, his career was interrupted when Japanese carrier aircraft attacked the US fleet without warning at Pearl Harbor, bringing the United States into the Second World War. Among the crowds of volunteers, Dr. Herman Tarnauer was in the forefront, and Washington soon commissioned him to serve in the US Army Air Corps. There he spent a successful war, and when the planes carrying the atomic bombs took off, General Douglas MacArthur assigned Major Herman Tarnauer to the Atomic Bomb Casualty Survey Commission. mushroom cloud formed over Nagasaki, his commission prepared to study the effects of the blast on the people who lived there. He was on the first plane to land at Nagasaki after the Japanese surrendered. The destruction made a lasting impression on him, turning him from a hawk into a dove when discussion about war came up. 70,000 people died in the first blast and Herman Tarnauer realized that many times that number would be the victims of radiation sickness in the years to come. So impressed was he with Japan that back home he built himself a house with a strong Japanese influence. He also built and owned a medical center for Scarsdale in the same style. At first housing four doctors, it rapidly expanded until nine specialists shared the premises. The affluent who lived in Westchester made it, and him, a great medical and financial success. Outside his work, he believed in having a good time. A highly eligible bachelor, he took an endless succession of women on tropical trips, but never allowed himself to get too involved with any one of them. The game parks of Africa were favorite hunting grounds. He shot several animals and had their heads mounted for display. Some women complained he did the same with them. When a publisher discovered his one-page diet notes for patients, he convinced him to compile the Scarsdale diet. Tarnauer explained its success. To summarize why it works, it's simple, it's safe, it's uh, satisfying, and it's effective. He promised followers a loss of a pound a day by cutting out fat, butter, bread, alcohol, and cream, and became an instant media celebrity appearing on America's top chat shows. Scarsdale Medical Diet. Would you welcome Dr. Herman Tarnauer? In a society where being slim ranks almost as high as being rich, Herman Tarnauer seemed to have discovered the secret of both. He displayed a relaxed charm as he reveled in the publicity, working it like a professional. A low-fat cottage cheese with a tablespoonful of low-fat sour cream, oh. lots of walnuts, and fresh fruit. Any fruit that you want. And if you try it, Merv, if you try it, you'll be addicted, just as I am. No doubt about it. And don't get off at Tuckahoe. Go right to Scarsdale. Ah, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, not to stay on that diet longer than two weeks. You tell him That's then right. get off. That's right. 
Three million copies of his book were sold, grossing $11 million. His first acknowledgement was to a friend who helped with the research and writing of his bestseller. These special thanks went to Jean Harris, school teacher, historian, socialite, and mistress of Herman Tarnauer for the past 14 years. The mother of two grown-up sons, she had reached the peak of her profession. As headmistress of the exclusive and expensive Madeira School, she was in the Washington Social Register. But although she presented a confident face to the world, inside she was in turmoil. While she carried out her duties with conviction, she was living off Dexedrine, better known as Speed. This made her schizophrenic and liable to burst into fits of anger. She had ironically just upset her board by expelling four girls for smoking pot. Nicknamed Integrity Jean, she lived a secret life of desperate passion for the doctor, who was notorious for a succession of casual affairs. With her family grown up and living away, she felt alone and was only too aware that Herman Tarnauer, generally known as High, had got himself a new mistress, one who was a serious rival. Lynn Treforos had been taken on as his administrative assistant, but she was soon in his bed. There followed a bitter struggle, and the last straw was this small ad placed by Lynn in the New York Times. Happy New Year, High. Love always, Lynn. It appeared while High and Jean were holidaying in Miami and caused a huge row. Finally, Jean Harris snapped. On the evening of the 10th of March at her house on the school campus in McLean, Virginia, she wrote a 10-page letter to her lover, collected her gun and drove furiously through the rainy night to his house. When she was arrested, she reportedly told the police, I shot him, I did it. She said she had come in the hope that he would kill her. She wept, he wanted to live, I wanted to die. Later that morning, Police Chief William Harris made a statement to the press. She made certain admissions, which I wouldn't know if you would call it a confession or not. Did she admit to shooting the doctor? She admitted that she, uh, that she had shot him. When the story broke, the papers had a field day and sent an array of reporters digging for dirt. Nowhere was the scandal more shocking than at the Madeira School. The school's president had to announce the news. On behalf of everyone at the school, I want to say that we are most distressed to learn of unfortunate events affecting Mrs. Harris, the headmistress. The search of the doctor's house had revealed signs of a violent quarrel. In the bathroom was Lynn's negligee. In the garden was a box of her curlers that Jean had thrown out, shattering a window. Jean Harris was arraigned in Harrison Town Court on the 13th of March, 1980. She was released on $40,000 bail, put up by her brother and sister. On the 26th of March, she was charged with second-degree murder and two counts of criminal possession of a pistol. Eight months later, her trial began in White Plains, New York. Spurning a plea bargain, she pleaded not guilty and prepared to fight. She chose as her lawyer a flamboyant criminal attorney named Joel Arnaud. He took the line that the shooting had happened accidentally while Tarnauer was trying to stop Jean Harris committing suicide. If he could get her off, she would inherit the $220,000 left to her in Tarnauer's will. If she were found guilty of his murder, she would lose it. Lynn Treforos and family had been left the same amount. The trial lasted three months and provided a daily soap opera for the eager press. Prosecutor George Bolan painted a picture of a woman blinded by jealousy. She had tolerated a string of casual lovers in the past, but now she was faced with a real rival. The jury, eight women, four men, were told that she wrote a suicide note and collected her .32 caliber gun. The prosecution described how the first bullet went through Tarnauer's hand, proving that he was trying to shield himself and ended in his chest. 
Harris told the police that she had left the house to get help. But they noticed she had taken her gun and coat with her. She also told them she only produced the gun to commit suicide in front of him, but he came at her and grabbed it. Upstairs, the doctor was left on his knees, dying in blood-drenched pajamas. Next came the defense's opening statement. The shooting was just a tragic accident, and Arno tried to deflect press questioning. Over the weeks, a total of 93 witnesses gave evidence. And the lines were so long that spectators were allowed in only for one hour each. Here was their chance to glimpse into the passionate lives of the rich and famous. At last came the witness they were all awaiting. The outwardly upright headmistress, forced to reveal the details of her affair in open court. She insisted that she had never intended to harm the doctor. Her explanation was that he had pushed her hand, away and down. I pulled the trigger with suicide in mind, I fell back and I got up and ran. Did she convince the public who listened avidly? I sympathize completely with her, but she surely didn't pick the right way to solve it. Cross-examined by Prosecutor Boland, Jean Harris said that she had planned to sue Lynn Treforos when the new mistress cut up a thousand dollars worth of her clothes. Boland encouraged her to blacken Lynn and Jean Harris obliged with such descriptions as dishonest slut, lacking taste, and added, a whore is a whore is a whore. But all this venom went to show just how much she hated her rival and provided a motive for premeditated murder. To her embarrassment, the 10-page letter she had written to him on the day of the shooting was permitted to be read out at the trial. In it, she complained that he preferred the company of a vicious, adulterous psychotic to her. You made me feel like a piece of discarded garbage, jeered at, old and pathetic. I stay at home while you make love to someone who has almost destroyed me. The effect of the letter was to reinforce the impression that here was a woman who felt angry and slighted enough to kill. The prosecutor followed up this theme, and as the jury listened intently, Bolin asked, isn't it true you intended to kill Dr. Tarnauer and then kill yourself? Because if you couldn't have him, nobody else would. She replied, no. The Scarsdale letter, as it was christened by the press, had been mailed by Jean Harris on the morning of the crime and had not reached the doctor's house until after he was dead. Its reading in court brought to mind the lines, heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. The talk among spectators was not whether she was guilty, but how long she would have to serve in jail. Well, it seems to me that, you know, just a matter of how guilty she is. There's no question about whether she did it or not. In your mind? Well, from what I've read. In his closing address, Prosecutor George Bolan hammered away to the jury on one single point. Finding the negligee in the bathroom had set off a rage that ended in the firing of five bullets. Three of these went straight into Herman Tarnauer's defenseless body. In his final address to the jury, Jean's attorney portrayed her as a deeply disturbed woman who wanted her lover to kill her. He concluded, there is no evidence that Jean Harris ever intended to kill Herman Tarnauer. This suicidal sick woman was obsessed with dying. That's why she's not guilty of murder. As she stumbled out of court, dazed by the press attention she was getting, the wait for the verdict began. For eight days and nights, the mostly blue-collar jury wrestled with the evidence. They knew that a guilty verdict meant jail for Jean Harris for a minimum of 15 years. Finally, they sent word to Judge Russell R. Leggett. They were ready. And on the 28th of February, 1981, Jean Harris was found guilty of second-degree murder and unlawful possession of a gun. Judge Leggett told the jury, the evidence substantiates the verdict, and announced that sentencing would be in a month's time. Jean Harris was taken to Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. In protest, she began a partial hunger strike. She said she would rather be dead than in jail. The press pursued her to jail, fascinated by the spectacle of Queen Jean, as they called her, getting her comeuppance. 
being ordered about wasn't easy for her to take. Tired and desperate, she wrote sadly in her diary, it is a new experience for someone who has lived in a world where logic and decency still play some role to wake up in the clutches of correctional officers. On the 20th of March, 1981, she was taken back to court. There she heard Judge Russell Leggett sentence her to prison for the minimum term of 15 years. In a dignified and desperate plea, she responded, I did not murder Herman Tarnow. I loved him very much. For you to arrange my life so that I will live in a cage is not justice, but a travesty of justice. No one feels his loss more than I do. Although the sentence ruled out parole, many people expected an early release, but it was not to be. Gradually, she got used to her new surroundings, hoping against hope that one day the truth as she saw it would prevail. Her two sons, David and James, were frequent visitors, and there came a day when she was allowed to give a remarkable interview to camera. There are many people outside who think I either died five years ago or was let out five years ago. A lot of people are surprised that I'm still in here. She tried to account for the severity of the sentence. They thought I was the, the absolute bitch at Buchenwald when I came in. I don't know where they got that opinion. And they were happy to see me go because also it proved a point. It isn't just poor black women who go to prison. It's middle class white women who go to prison too. She gradually came to terms with iron bars, and having been there so long, became a senior figure in the jail. Two young women who've just come in were walking in back of me a couple of days ago, and I heard one of them say to the other, that's Jean Harris. She's been here a long time, and I have been here a long time. She agreed that her long experience of being the one to give orders had made her less than a model prisoner. Of all people, Jane, that I should be the one to disillusion you. No, I haven't been a model prisoner. I think of myself as a model prisoner. I essentially mind my own business, and I don't steal things, and I don't lie and cheat and sleep around or do any of the things that go on around here all the time. But I, uh, I talk back. My mother used to call it impudence, and I guess I'm still impudent sometimes when I say what I think to the people who are pulling my strings. Once she settled down, she devoted herself to the prison parenting service, helping young women learn to be mothers. She wrote a book about her case, which she called Stranger in Two Worlds, and gave the royalties to the prison nursery where she worked. Did she learn from the experience? I think so. Unfortunately, that is a poor way to become worldly. I don't recommend it to anyone. I don't want anyone to think that I'm lucky to have been here, but I... I, I, I'm lucky to be learning everyone. I mean, if you stop learning, you stop really existing. Looking back, what was it that went wrong with her defense? I should have plea bargained, I suppose. And, and uh, I didn't, but I, I had very bad legal advice. She was a woman who was used to giving orders rather than taking them. Her lawyer, Joel Arnaud, was adamant that she wouldn't take his advice and enter the defense of extreme emotional disturbance. She did what I thought no client should do, and that is she ruled out defenses that would have helped her. Russell Leggett, the judge who presided over the trial, was equally forthright. She was just naive in refusing to allow her attorney to, to plead extreme emotional disturbance. He called the shooting a crime of passion that should never have been so severely punished. Most of them would have been smart enough to say, hey, I'm caught with the smoking gun. I'll plead extreme emotional disturbance, and they would have been out. Joel Arnaud had no doubts about her reasons. She had a greater fear than being convicted. She had a fear that they would find that there was something wrong with her, mentally. And that would affect her teaching career, and you could not get her off that. I should have had a stronger lawyer who didn't listen to me, I guess. <laughs> who said, look, shut up and sit down and I'll tell you what we're going to do. You're not going to tell me what to do. Whatever the reason for her plea, the result was a tragic error which put her away for an unnecessarily long time. What would the judge have given her if she had agreed to accept a plea bargain? Had Jean been convicted of manslaughter, 
uh, because she acted under extreme emotional disturbance, her sentence would probably have been no more than a minimum of four and a maximum of 12. She has done more time out of the minimum than I would have probably given her as a maximum. Further mitigation should have come from evidence about the drug she was taking, but this was never offered at the trial. Which I, to me was a little white pill. I found out from my lawyer, it's called speed on the street. And who prescribed it? Dr. Herman Tarnauer, the doctor she trusted above all. The effect that the drugs might have had was never discussed at the trial, nor was the reason why they might have been prescribed. For, for um, overwork, I guess, and for exhaustion, and I said, well, here, take some of this. It's pep you up. I take it sometimes myself. The drug she was convinced that the drugs played a vital role. In, not just in time. High's death, but in my life during those years. It, it was, I was constantly being told, calm down, and I wanted to bite them when they said, calm down, because I couldn't calm down. Also never asked at the trial was the question, was she addicted not to drugs, but to her doctor? I suppose you could make a case that, yes, I, was, I think he became an addiction. I, I, I guess he did. Mario Cuomo, governor of New York, thrice turned down appeals for clemency. Yet virtually all the participants in her trial, including the jury, favored her release after 10 years in prison. Jean Harris seemed resigned to her fate. I'm being treated as though I were one of the most dangerous, vicious women in the state of New York. Then, unexpectedly, early in 1993, in her 13th year of captivity, Jean Harris was released. It was a doctor who called me who had just been on the phone to, to Albany to the, the governor and he said I, I'm calling to tell you that the governor is granting you clemency and he want, wanted me to tell you before you went in for your operation. In her earlier interview she had seemed to have the last word about the man who had caused such turmoil in her life. I think you should think of him as a very interesting man who had I don't think a very good sense of values. He was very self-centered but whatever he was, I found it very appealing, and I was very much in love with him. 